with a bang, energy and change came to every part of our universe. Seismic or small, it continues. Change is all around us. Shaped by technology and human ingenuity. We can make it work for you and your business. Good morning, everyone. My name is Margaret Mueller. I'm the president and CEO of the Executives Club of Chicago. Thank you for joining us this morning for a really exciting conversation. To begin, I want to take a moment to thank all of our generous sponsors who help ensure that all of our programming like today's program are possible. First, today's presenting sponsor, Accenture. We'd also like to acknowledge our gold sponsor, Edelman, and our silver sponsors, Discover and ZS Associates. We encourage you to submit questions. We're gonna to try to get to as many as we can. It's gonna be a packed discussion. So please enter your questions with the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you run into any technical issues, just email programs at executivesclub.org and members of the team are on hand to assist. I'm really excited to kick this off, our conversation about privacy and big data. And here to introduce our speakers is Richard Edelman, Chief Executive Officer of Edelman, and also a member of our Board of Directors. Over to you, Richard. Thank you. Um, so Alex and uh, Wilfred are going to debate um, technology as sword and shield, how we uphold civil liberties and privacy rights in a world of big data. But um, since Edelman does the trust barometer every year, I think it's important to hear the incredible uh, fall from grace that uh, tech has endured in the last year. For example, in the United States, tech, which has been the leading uh, sector in trust for the entire time that we've done this survey, is now the ninth most trusted. It's fallen in two years um, from 75% to 57% trust. Um, it's in fact a true fall from grace. This is not just an American phenomenon. The drop in trust in tech is global. We're at all time lows for tech in 17 of 27 countries, China, Japan, UK, et cetera, accelerating drops. Why? Number one is fear of job loss to automation. Um, number two is people being scared about privacy and it's affected their willingness to share personal data to help fight against the pandemic, for example. Third is disinformation. We're clearly living in an era of information bankruptcy. I would also point out that tech employees are, according to our data, the most likely to speak out and protest against their own companies. You'll remember that Google had that walkout in fall 2019 because of that large Me Too settlement, then protests against ICE contracts at Salesforce and others. I, I, I do just wanna say Alex Karp is a different person relative to the rest of the leaders of the tech industry. You know, not only the kind of work that he does, he's, so, he's deeply patriotic, he actually helped save American soldiers' lives in Iraq when he found IEDs and where they were placed on roads through his technology. Also, um, his willingness to stand up for that which uh, is necessary and right about what and how technology should behave. So Wilfred um, Frost is the uh, anchor of CNBC's Closing Bell, and these two are ready to go and give us a good show. Over to the two of you. Thank you. We certainly are, Richard. Thank you very much for the intro and Margaret also for the intro. And uh, Alex, uh, welcome. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Happy to be here. Nice, very happy I could spend time with you guys. And as, as Margaret and Richard mentioned, we're, we're aiming for about 40 minutes now of uh, Q&A led by me and then 10 to 15 minutes of uh, audience questions. So please do submit them and uh, we'll, we'll get to those uh, towards the end. And Alex, a, a very simple one just to kick things off. Uh, how would you, in under a minute, describe what, what Palantir is, what Palantir does? Well, first of all, I want to thank Richard for the very kind introduction, uh, which means a lot to me and all of my fellow Palantirians. Um, Palantir supplies world-class software to some of the most important institutions in the world, especially those in the intel and defense uh, world, America and its allies, uh, uh, and to commercial entities all over the world. The software is the underlying motor of their work, so it powers special forces, it powers a lot of the operations that are done, it powers the way in which intelligence and clandestine services all over the world do their work and cor in correspondence civil liberties. And on the commercial side, there's a thousand applications for our 
data integration motor and the, the full stack of software we provide. The shortest answer is in a world where software is largely a complete and unmitigated disappointment, if not disaster, and comes in the category of useless or uh, totally uh, non-working, we supply software to the, the institutions that I think most of the people in this room believe support us, including the institutions that you run, uh, that is not only useful, but in the clandestine context, uh, often exceedingly useful, both in terms of finding our enemies and protecting our civil liberties. So, so when you also, just another introductory question, when you consider the, the growth in big data analytics and software more broadly, it's been huge over the last decade, it's been huge over the last year or two. Where are we on the curve of that? Are we in the first innings? Well, the, 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 I, think, I think the way to look at this is um, we, we've gone through a number of industrial uh, revolutions. And by the way, one, one of the things that Richard is essentially alluding to was that uh, tech, largely American, often West Coast, but Midwestern American were the dominant parts of it, was both linked to uh, progress uh, for society and cr the creation of wealth. Um, and so now we have this thing where uh, software is really often very much linked to a couple small group of people on the West Coast getting wealthy. Um, and you have uh, where, where we are in, in, in this cycle is this, um, to, to, to your question, it's, it's we are at the way beginning of a disruption where uh, software and its execution end up being the determinant variable of, of military, clandestine and commercial success. And so what you had led by America, um, it, it was starting, quite frankly, I would say with the Manhattan Project, where we we often forget we built the impossible in a record amount of time with almost with de minimis resources uh, and then winning uh, the Cold War. And then um, where, but, but these things were often hardware, hardware, chemicals, hardware, nuclear, hardware, something uh, uh, focused. And what, what you had with, you could call Silicon Valley or tech revolution 2.0 is that you had uh, companies mostly on the West Coast of America that are the very best at executing on software and turning your data into a product, a product which is so disruptive that they disrupt every company around them. Um, and that, that revolution is at the beginning because uh, companies like the companies that are represented here and all over America and all over the world are going to implement software and combine their business acuity, their operational acuity and world-class software in an effort to create jobs uh, wealth and prosperity, and also to succeed in the, the the competition of business. So I would say, I think we will look back at this time as a conver converging point where software and where the hardware was used to be dominant. Now the software and execution will be dominant. And what you're already seeing now is that on the military, especially military and commercial front, uh, countries and entities that are, are good at software have a just an enormous advantage, even if nothing else works. And clearly, you mentioned uh, all of the Silicon Valley growth in the last the last decade. And if you snapshot the market cap of tech companies and where it's headquartered, uh, it, it paints a very clear picture of, of the U.S. lead in this tech innovation, uh, software innovation of the last decade. Today, if you snapshot what's likely to evolve over the next decade, would the U.S. still have the same scale of lead over the rest of the world in terms of that level of innovation? Well, it, it depends. Um, you know, just just you know, don't expect many people are actually tracking our our company. But you know, it's like I think there's a lot of what, what's very positive in America is we were born in Silicon Valley. I think we were the first company of our size to move. We moved our headquarters to Denver. Uh, I think there will be a wider distribution of 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 tech uh, tech companies outside of Silicon Valley in America. But to your question, um, America is for lots of reasons the best at building software. Uh, there are other countries that do it very well. If you look at uh, Germany has some strong companies, Israel is very strong, there are other countries. But if you look at just purely on the vulgar metric of, of, of market cap, so the, the, the battleships of, of, of software uh, tend structurally to be in the US. I think they will move from the West Coast further into the Midwest. I'm very happy with our decision to move uh, into Denver for lots of reasons, including a, a, a lack of a complete monoculture that you have in Silicon Valley. 
that you don't have in other places. But um, but but there's a, there's an underlying question, and since you're stuck with me for I guess a full hour, I'll just give you the longer exegesis on some of the advantages that uh, America has in this one area. And by the way, I'm not saying in every area. Um, I, I think there are areas where we're, we're not you know particularly advantaged over uh, allies and adversaries. But the soft, it's interesting to ask why has America been so dominant in this one area and. You know, I spent a lot of my adult life outside of America in Germany, writing a PhD and then building our business. We have a large business in, in, in Japan. We have a large business um, in in uh, in Europe and then in, to some extent in other places. But um, it, there's there's a convergence of intellectual veracity, uh, pragmatism, and I would say Midwestern ability to do teamwork. Um, that software is very much a team sport. Uh, it's a believer sport. So. If you compare cultures I know pretty well, Germany, France, um, these are these are these are these are cultures with very very deep engineering uh, uh, cultures, very very highly qualified engineers, mathematical acuity that certainly rivals, and in some cases better than what you we would be able to produce. Um, however, uh, we in America are much better at having a crazy dream. Our crazy dream was, as an example we are going to give clandestine services and the US military the very best software in the world. And at the time, again, since you're stuck with me longer than you may want, I'll just, it's in, you may not, the, the, the way in which software was procured in the US was uh, they would give out billions of dollars for products that were built over years. And one of the really interesting things about software and one of the big advantages we have in building software in America is a lot of the common sense assumptions we have about software are just, just not right. So the common sense assumption a lot of people had in the US government was if you spent $10 billion and you had 10,000 engineers, you would have a better product than if you spent $30 million and you bought it from a completely mad looking CEO and a motley crew of people that looked like they're 12. And this is false. Uh, and, you know, and so we, we got the US government to buy products instead of services. We said that you could solve civil liberties and solve targeting in the same time. So software has a unique attribute. You can take two difficult problems that are contradictory and solve them at the same time, like finding terrorists and protecting civil liberties, like lowering costs and having better software. Um, and so uh, this, 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 like this ability. So then that brings me to a last advantage we that that I think gives America structural advantage on the software thing. Um, it's uh, you know where America is is. It has a lot of structural issues that you know get a lot of attention and should get attention. Um, we're very adaptive. You know, if I compare this to other places I've lived a lot of my life, um, America is like the U.S. military completely got rid of the way it's been procuring technology, basically, to buy technology more effectively in a period of a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And it's like an amazing thing. It's like you've been buying technology in one way for decades. Along comes a, uh, you know, a small company that says, look, we believe it's really important that we show you the software works before you buy it, that you pay attention to civil liberties or as they call it outside of America data protection, that you buy a product and not services, that we can scale across all these things, that we can provide certain kinds of security attributes you would, and stability of code you can't have with one-off products. Sounds bonkers crazy. And they changed. And this happened in a relatively quick time amount of time. So it's like, I, I think America is going to do very, very well on the software front. Now, there's a caveat to your question, which is, how does that translate into our military? And that, in military and defense, having the best software companies in the world doesn't mean you have the best software in the context of the US uh, efforts to defend itself and rival our adversaries, especially in kind of the AI context. There, I think America's made great strides and very optimistic. Uh, much more optimistic than we were years ago, precisely because we've changed procurement because of the realization that uh, people running these things in a clandestine military services realize that America can do very well and win, but not if it's bringing the, you know, 50,000 hours of services and that whole thing instead of rallying our very best of the best to our cause. Last problem before I turn it back to you, the, the real problem on how America does in that context also comes down to the unwillingness from my myopic perch, totally uh, uh, in, 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 impossible to understand unwillingness of a number of tech uh, companies and engineers to support the US government. Now, I don't think everything the US government does is right. I don't agree with a lot of things. I'm a citizen and like many people, I'm sure everyone listening, we have our agreements and disagreements. 
but um, the, 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 the odd reality that many in Silicon Valley are not willing to support the US government in military context is something that should be a source of great uh, discussion. And you know, I, for one, always want to hear, well, if that's the case, how do you justify the fact that you're building your company in the US and driving on our highways and, and getting protection from countries that are unhappy with your the, the encroachment on their sovereignty simply because they don't want to offend the US government and our taxpayers. So that, that is a really big issue in America uh, that you know many of our software elites have a very different view on how you should support the country that has supported us than say we do at Palantir and I do personally. I, I wasn't going to get to this topic yet, but, but, I, but I will and I'll follow up on, on what you just said. Why do you think that is? I mean, please call out some company names if you want to, but even if you don't. Well, what is the motivation not to say? there's a long answer. Um, I think the short answer is that they, some of them just don't have the sense God gave a goat. Um, and they confuse having a high IQ with being sensible. Like, you know, it's, 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 it, it, it's like, but in any case, the longer answer would be um, something like, um, I, I think there's just a, just a, not an understanding of the historical reality of tech. And by the way, to, to Richard's point, which I thought was quite well put about trust, it, it is completely self-destructive. We get away, in, in those of us who are entrepreneurs, for looking weird and living our own lives and, and not being particularly conformist because people in America see that we're creating value for them. And if the, the Silicon Valley of the, of the first generation was building things that Americans understood would help them. If you're sitting on your perch in Silicon Valley, and you're only creating value for yourself, monetizing the natural resources of other uh, of your fellow Americans and others in the form of monetizing their data and providing no value to them, uh, except for disrupting the businesses that people work at, you're going to find that your level of trust, it goes re really down really far quickly. And, you, and I don't think this is something you can kind of IQ your way out of, which is, I think, essentially one of the problems in Silicon Valley. They just think that they're so smart that they can smart their way out of this. And, but, you know, it's just so obvious. And um, so I think, and then there's the historical reality. I think a lot who of people in, in so, Alex. Yep. Who are the worst offenders? Well, you know, they shift. I mean, I don't, I don't it's like, I don't, I don't know if it's helpful. Like, you know, people, it, it comes in a rolling, in a rolling set of offenses. I, I, and, I, and by the way, I'm hopeful there at some point could be some reform because now this is something that, uh, really, most people are very, very aware of. And by the way, it's a reason why a lot of us, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I, I believe we were the first company to leave the Valley. When we left the Valley, it was looked at, looked at as something completely crazily ridiculous. Who could leave the Valley? Now, lots of people are leaving the Valley. And part of the reason they're leaving the Valley is because the, the brand of the Valley is not good. <laughs> and it's not good because they can't answer simple questions. What does your software do to help somebody? And the answer will be, I give a lot of money to philanthropy. Well, I'm all in favor of philanthropy, but there has to be a more direct answer. What does your business do? Or maybe there should be a more direct answer. Our country, our company does nothing to help humanity and we're okay with that. But there's like, so in any case, I, I, think, I think that there's a rolling set of offenders. I think the rolling set of offenders will probably change over time, not for the right reasons, but simply because it just can't go on like this. To, to what extent do you blame them personally because for example, their motivation is just profit maximization without uh, any other consideration versus except that they have a duty to their shareholders. Uh, and also, if regulation doesn't exist, they, you know, have every right to continue operating in the way that they are. I, I don't dispute anyone's right to, uh, to work within the context of a law. And part, I mean, and I very much believe these things should be regulated so that people can have you know, work within the context of the law, and 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 it is true that it's so. But if you are on the cutting edge, just to take the very simple example of that, our myopic perch helping the Western world stay as strong and become stronger in the future, and so that the West uh, structurally wins uh, the battles of, uh, of both the software battles, but also the narrative battle of what it means to organize a society, a society where we there's wealth provision, education. Uh, civil liberties are protected, and we can have open discourse. Um, uh, if, in fact, you are profit maximizing it in your country, and that country is protecting you, you have a duty to protect the country. So 
you know, you can, you can, I mean, I love academic debates of this sort, and I'd be more than happy to go down the rabbit hole of, you know, at what, at what point do you, do you, is it, is it incumbent on someone to diverge and to diverge from their actual economic interest and do good? And that, that's a really, really important debate. But in the context of we are the global winners of X, and we are partly the global winners because we are in a country, you can't, the answer cannot be we do not support that country. And, and that, that, so that, that would be my first baseline. And then after that, we can have a more erudite, erudite debate. I, I do think, yeah. Well, no, it's, I was going to say, I'll, I'll try one last time to, to, to ask you. And again, I understand if you don't want to say it, but which company or CEO is, is the big offender today on, on that front? Well, you know, I'm not trying to evade the answer and invading the answer. I just think, uh, you know, it's like it really is a thing like on Tuesday, it's X. On Wednesday, it's Y. I, I think... The, uh, I think Silicon Valley as a culture mm -hmm. is the great offender. I, I actually don't think it's an individual thing. And I'm not just trying to like evade your answer because that's my job. Apparently my lawyers tell me my job is to evade the answers of journalists and never answer a question. And by the way, they're going to get me into these workshops. So I learned to like yeah, evade answers better and never say anything. However, a, so far I've evaded them. But, uh, um, but, uh, but, but I think it's a, I really think it's a cultural problem. They're sitting in their perch in Silicon Valley where they're the smartest, the best and the richest. They don't understand how they're viewed in society or how that's viewing our society. And, uh, and then when asked, uh, can they help a, a America? They, they tend to think this is a super difficult question that should be litigated with the one or two or five engineers in their company that don't agree with helping the US government. And I think it's a cultural problem. And that's why so many of us have left this culture. And, and there's a, another sort of slightly different angle on what could be the consequence of this. Do you think we're at a tipping point? Perhaps we pass the tipping point when consumers start to turn on these services as well because they decide that the cost of giving up their data, their cost of, of giving up some of their privacy is uh, more expensive than the, the services they've been getting for free, as it were, in recent years. Are consumers um, Probably, but probably not quick enough. Um, it, it's just um, because it, it's again the soft that the technical abilities of Silicon Valley are unparalleled, and it just makes it super super easy. Like the products are built for ease; it's easy to do it. It's caught, it appears to be free. I I think that governments have to be involved. Um, I think governments have to be involved for two reasons. One, because um, clearly Silicon Valley doesn't seem to believe self regulation is a concept that means much, and B. Um, I think the, the cost to the corrosion of our discourse and also the wealth disparity is so high that it, could, it will, over time, will lead to just totally uh, uh, dystopian uh, discussions uh, and feeds into the hands of people that may, in fact, uh, have less on the remedy side, but more on the populist side, which I don't think is in anyone's interest. So I think, I think that, that that's where this is going to have to go. I think. It's interesting if this is also generally the view outside of America, it's becoming the view inside of America. Uh, and I, I think that there will, I, I, I believe there will be change, but not quick enough. Um, in terms of the good time, I think to come to the, the words mentioned in the title of this discussion about whether tech is a, a sword or a shield. But overall, despite the last uh, 10, 15 minutes of our discussion, I presume your conclusion is today that it is uh, much more a force for good than it is uh, for bad. Is, is that fair? Um, I think I agree with that. Um, but I, I think strong tech is always a sharp instrument. So if you take our product, um, you know, we, we have, we, we power most of the clandestine services in Europe, the most data protection rich environment. You can't even sell your product in some countries in Europe until you prove the civil liberties protections will work. Um, and the, which in, in, in kind of more just plain terms means we can show exactly how the software is working, who actually touched the, the, the actual targeting package, how they touched it, what the data sources were in the European context, what was purged, what was not purged. Um, uh, however, any tech that actually does something effective can be abused, uh, which is why there is always a need for like government sovereignty, government uh, uh, governments being involved, consumer, uh, customer, uh, citizen advocacy to understand. By the way, it's another reason why tech has to be built so it can be made transparent. In our case, 
it's so easy to like sell something. In many cases, these things don't actually work, but a black box and it's like, there has to be a way to take the box apart and see what's happening in the engine as a way of creating transparency. And to the introductory point, you know, there's a crisis of legitimacy um, around, around these things. And there's a legitimate side of that crisis of legitimacy, which is uh, these very sharp tools can be abused, will be abused if they're not looked at carefully. Uh, and then there's got to be a way that normal people uh, can look at the tech and evaluate, is this being used? Under what conditions is it being used? And is it, is it being used in a way that is either not legal or not ethical or something? Or do we need to change the law because our norms have changed around how the use of the tech should happen? But I, I do think uh, every technical advance is something that could be abused. Um, and uh, it, in aggregate, the advances are you know way much outweigh uh, the the dangers, but obviously there are dangers. I want to get on to um, <laughs> military uses uh, and then also what you do for individual clients in a moment, but just to round that part off, uh, are you optimistic regulators and lawmakers are on top of this uh, that we'll see the right regulation in the next year or two or, or not? Um, I don't know, actually. The true answer is I don't know. It's like, it depends on how much of a push people uh, make on their on our leaders. Um, there has to be a technical discourse about what what is what is actually changed, um, and so I would put it at like 50 50. Um, switching uh, focus or, or a bit more on specifically the military classes that we might have in, in the next decade or so. Hopefully, we won't. How important is it that the U.S. maintains it, its innovation lead on on the tech side, so as either to be able to use it in a conflict if necessary, or, or rather uh, to avoid the need for a conflict. Will the next conflict be sparked? Yeah. Um, th there's a lot of points here, and, 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 and this would be where there's a legitimate intellectual uh, dis uh, uh, disagreement between me and most people, I would say, in Silicon Valley. But, um, but the, the interesting thing about software is it, it's, it, it, it's just nonlinear to the extreme. So we tend to want to believe things we're working on or things we product tech products we we interact with are similar and it largely comes down to taste. Um, what do I prefer in X tech product versus Y? But de facto I could switch and there's usually a cost difference and that that may be more the case in hard, hardware. It's not the case in software. So this is again back to why do I think America will continue to produce uh, world class. Uh, disruptive software companies. It's because it, it, there's a culture to do this. The culture is disruptive and the output is totally nonlinear. So one country can spend a hundred billion dollars and a, a small group of startups in Chicago can spend, can get financing worth a hundred million and they just massively outperform the country that spent the hundred billion dollars. Um, and so um, the, the, to your question, um, I believe the West and America in particular needs the best software enhanced systems or software systems precisely so that we don't have conflicts. Because if in fact our adversaries have the best software systems, software empowered systems, or in the end, pure software, which you could call advanced AI, there's AI is often thrown around as a jargon term, but in this context, military technology powered by somewhat or completely autonomous systems or human powered systems that also have autonomous capabilities. Um, uh, that those capabilities are not gonna be even. It's not gonna be one is here and one is here. It's one is in the, you know, at the moon and one is on the, at a skyscraper range. And the country, and this is where I just flat out have a disagreement with most people, uh, I would say in the Valley, but often others, and it's a legitimate disagreement, I guess. I, I believe if one country has a nuclear bomb and the other country has a set of dull knives, the country with the nuclear bomb is gonna define how the world works. And they are gonna have very little interest in what you know, maybe, and, and many of my academic friends disagree with me. I, I believe in universal norms. I want universal norms. I believe in like Kantian ethics and the American constitution. But if, if, we, if, if our adversary has a nuclear bomb and we have a dull knife, I do not believe that these kind of norms will ipso facto sprout from the hearts of humans and the world order that we like to live in will actually exist in the way we like to live in it. And, and I think the, the, the mistake in the framing is to either on the one hand, assume that the 
the, the delivery of arms is going to be in any way similar. So that's linear. So it's a 10, 20% difference and you can make up with it by spending extra capital, which is just, just not the case in software. Or they believe the norms uh, of, of our adversaries will inherently migrate to our norms under some kind of interesting uh, self-referential dialectic that happens automatically, which I largely don't understand as an argument. Now that you can have that argument, I don't understand it and don't subscribe to it. And, and, and at Palantir, we believe that to have the kind of norms that we want to live in in the world, there has to be parity, at least parity, if not superiority in the, in the context of delivering software to America and its allies. Is, is there a country that's close to being ahead of the US or, or has a chance of being ahead on this front? China, perhaps, Russia, Korea? Well, China and Russia are, are both, like, you know, one of the things I, I did this crazy PhD in, in Germany and, um, and one of the most important things I learned was that we were taught to like take the argument uh, that we are disagreeing with it, make it into the very best argument humanly possible, switch out the, switch out everything, and then defeat the argument. And so, like, I, I think we should just because we have so many disagreements with uh, China and, and Russia on so many fronts, we should not ever underestimate how sophisticated these cultures and countries are at highly technological things. Uh, including software, but other 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 things that 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 sometimes involve weapon systems, but just involve other things that just involve in technology. These are highly developed, uh, highly capable, uh, worthy uh, in the sense of they can produce things we can produce or better if we're not careful. Adversaries, um, and in both cases, I would I would I would be um, certainly uh, we would be remiss not to put our best foot forward. I would say in this context. One of the things that we believe, I believe, is um, you know, in Palantir and in my years of uh, building the company and uh, running it, is you, you really have to focus on your own business. So it's like the most helpful way to beat our rivals is to put our best foot forward, not to run around talking about how great they are. Obviously, we have to be aware of how strong they are. But America is more than capable, especially in the software con con context of having uh, of winning. Um, but it, it is very much the case of putting our best foot forward. And to your point, if we do not put our best foot forward, yeah, we won't win. Have you engaged with both the Trump administration and now the Biden administration on this? And has there been a change in response? Are you encouraged by the response? Um, well, you know, it's funny. We, we've worked with, like, our software has been in, in, in deployed under four presidents. The level at which these things happen is like us engaging with, uh, say someone running a, a part of the DOD or a part of a clandestine service. Um, these are highly capable professionals. Honestly, I wish more people had access to them because you know we, this crisis of legitimacy that we have across the West and in America as well is in part because the people that are doing some of the most interesting, coolest things and most important things that are highly competent and knowledgeable never show up in the public. Um, but we were, were very engaged along a whole series of these issues, many of which we're obviously not really allowed to say much about uh, under the last four presidents and uh, very hopeful that we'll, we'll be very engaged under, mm -hmm. uh, under this president. I want to switch focus a little bit and talk about uh, your work with various corporates. Um, of course, lots of business leaders listening today. How do you entice a company to, to, to do business with you? What's your pitch to them? Um, well, you know, the, the, the thing is, um, we, we have um, a, a number of the more important clients, companies in the world using our products. So like, in, in just as an example, 3M, Chrysler, Fiat, Rio Tinto, BP is a, a very, very long list. And a lot, of our, a lot of our growth, both in commercial and in government, is concentric circles of people saying, hey, why is it that ABC doesn't work? Uh, and in the beginning, in the Intel play services and DOD and in commercials, like, well, why don't you call that Motley company we've heard of with the crazy looking CEO with the 12 year olds? Because, uh, you know, we've heard that the software works. Um, and, um, and, you know, enterprise software is kind of a thing that where people often struggle to understand what its utility is. We went from use case to use case, basically. Now we have a technical thing on in both commercial and government where we believe we're supplying software the way it'll be supplied in five years. So in the, in the government context, we said we would supply instead of one-off systems bespoke built with literally a, a, a million hours of human labor and with a cost of a billion dollars, 
will install our software in weeks at a cost. Often we used to say, we used to go to clients in the, the, in the government space and say, it'll be 1% um, uh, of the time, 5% of the cost pay us when we've installed. Now in the government context, they often can't just pay you afterwards, but in the commercial context, we would say the same thing. In the beginning, we largely built our business around companies that were having a crisis and the CEO was very frustrated because they couldn't figure out why they couldn't rebuild or do A, B, C, D, why it was going to have to take eight months instead of what seemed to be something you could do. And there were there are very technical issues under those questions. Uh, in the commercial space, um, we have somewhat of a radical view. Uh, this is purely technical. This is not how we entice the clients. But our view is that uh, in five years, a great number of people are going to buy software the same way they buy every other technical product. They're not going to like when you're, we're talking here, you didn't install the 15 things into the camera, put it together and decide that your Frankenstein monster would be a great way to, to do this interview. You bought a finished product. Mm -hmm. Palantir, what makes Palantir uh, Foundry so unique and the way we manage it, Apollo, is that you can buy the whole stack. It'll be installed in a couple of days and you will not have to have a thousand products sewn together by a massive IT organization. However, we also believe, and this is totally counterintuitive, but is it actually a truism software, that the individual parts of that stack can be sold as modules, each of which is superior to the modules that you could otherwise buy from other companies, because the individual modularity is actually not in contradiction to building the whole stack, they actually reinforce each other. So what's unique technically is in both government and, 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 and in commercial is the way we actually deliver the software and the speed with which we can deliver it. And in the beginning, in both cases, we didn't even bother with that because it was like, look, you have a crisis, we will solve it. And after that, you can buy our software. And we did it for years and years. We insisted in the commercial space of doing it for free. Why? Of doing the pilot for free. Why? Because people are legitimately skeptical of software. All these software companies seem to have the same jargon on their website. How would you ever tell the difference between one person's jargon and another's? You know, it's like it, one of the most interesting things about software is if you're not a software engineer, it's very hard to evaluate the difference between jargon that makes no sense and is like a largely a waste of your time and something that actually can help you. And so we, we solve that by actually installing it. Now we have all these references when people now call us or want to know. My real answer is like, look, it's very hard to evaluate software. If you're a software engineer, we can explain to you technically. But you could also just call these five clients. You know, Palantir, in all modesty, we have the very best client list in the world. And that's despite having me as the front man. They're like, how does that happen? <laughs> it's like, you know, uh, 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 there's like, they, it, they, um, uh, the, the, it's like, so you have like this, so it, it, that's just, you know, the, way, the best way to evaluate software is say, okay, that sounds kind of interesting. Let me talk to someone who's used it. Let me do a pilot and do it on some problem you actually care about, not some esoteric problem. And then see, well, does it work? What are the costs? And the, you know, why is the thing I've invested in? And if there's only some part, like we have this great partnership, great partnerships with IBM and AWS. Another thing to look at is again, who are their partners? I mean, you know, we have a list, client list. I would say no other company in the world has a client list like ours on the clandestine service company list. And then we have these partners, IBM, AWS. I think those are two of the most notable, most interesting software companies that human history has produced. Well, I, I know I agree. And I, I have a follow up on that particular point if we get, have time. Um, but my quick follow up on, on that broad topic is all of the company names you've just listed are big, big companies. Is there a risk for smaller companies out there, even if you offer free service for a trial, um, that they get left behind over the next decade because they're scared to, to deploy capital on, on new expensive tech and, and they should have done perhaps, but up front and they haven't done? Um, you know, small, medium-sized companies are going to be very, very good for Palantir. So I'm, I'm highly biased here, but it's because, you know, most medium-sized companies have just enough soft money to pay for software that can be transformative for them today and no money for waste. And we love those companies and they're going to be very happy with us, I believe. And so we, we look at them as a massive opportunity. Um, and it, again, it's uh, and often these smaller companies are, you know, that it's, it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's you, you really, the smaller the company, the easier it is to know exactly what's being spent and how. And so, you know, we, it's true. We have um, brand name, I would say the among the best brand names in the world using Palantir and those contracts are very, very large because, you know, like 
uh, I think it's public report. One of our clients said they 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 they're they're making a billion dollars a year off of using our our product. And of course, they pay us sums of money a small company could never pay us. But of course, it's just a it's a it's a relatively modest portion of what they're making. Mm -hmm. However, um, I would tell you the other thing that that I think the smaller companies just have to be very very adaptive and hungry. You know, it's uh, and 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 software again, it's an unfair sport. You can be smaller if you execute on software. You will do very well against people who have resources that are ten times your size. Look at our little tiny company. We started not very long ago with five people. We power. We we are by far the most important company in the in in supplying software to governments in the West, and there there really no second. And so, like, how does that happen? So you can go from small to big uh, very quickly. I think this is also something American companies are really really good at be, uh, being adaptive, changing throwing out ideologies that don't work, working with people that you may never have worked with before. This is a, this is a cultural attribute of the USA. And I think one that we, Palantir, are gonna benefit and are benefiting from enormously already. You teed up uh, the IBM AWS partnership there. Some would have thought you guys would all be rivals. So what, what exactly are you doing with them? Um, well, I mean, first of all, the IBM AWS need no introduction and they don't need me or Palantir to extol their, their virtues. IBM is one of the, uh, you know, is the oldest, most uh, storied uh, and maybe has the largest global footprint of any software company in the world, uh, is a, just a absolutely dominant in certain jurisdictions. Uh, AWS is this uh, product juggernaut run by very, very technical people. Um, it, it, it's, um, it, it is very interesting in building partnerships that, you know, it, the classic cliche is you would, you know, it, it's, it's just very, it was very easy for us to work with them because we're 75% of us are engineers. Uh, the, not, the last other 20% of pound are highly quant quantitative. And so these are, these are great product companies. Um, you, you could say that we should be adversaries, but what I've ne what we've learned uh, in, in our work, both in the clandestine military service and commercial is companies at their level of talent and technical acuity know how hard it is to build what we've built. And so it's very, it's, it's a very quick discuss. It's much quicker, easier discussion with companies like this on how you'd partner, because we know what we have, we're not entering their space and perhaps they could enter our space, but they know how hard it is because building what we've built, especially the parts of the stack they want. Like in IBM's case, it's a module, they want some of our modularity, a part of our stack, but not all, but very hard to do. And then in AW's case, we're partnering on a number of use cases. They also know how hard it is to do. And then we respect their cultures. We work very well with them. And so if you, if you meet um, cultures that, that you work well with because of deep engineering prowess and similar kind of ideas of what would work and not, then the idea, then, then it's very easy to sort out, well, here we should work together, here we shouldn't because you have a pretty clear and, and deep understanding of the enormous problems that IBM has solved, that AWS has solved. We have no interest in trying to solve those problems. And I think they have a fair deal of respect for what we've done in a very short period of time. And so like when we make these claims that quite frankly, some on, on Wall Street have thought have been mad, like you know, we're providing software that in its totality, you can buy it once or its modularity is the best on the market. And that's how, and by the way, people will buy software in a different way. That seems mad maybe to someone looking at this from the outside. It doesn't seem mad to the two best, among the two best uh, software companies in the world because they know how difficult it would be to do that. And they can evaluate that what we're saying is absolutely true and they can do that very quickly. I wanted to ask uh, about being public. Uh, you've, you've mentioned the short termism in the past that can come out of Wall Street uh, by having to report every quarter. Uh, and clearly, you, you're more in the public eye and the crosshairs once you're a public company. Do you, do you weigh up going public and wonder sometimes whether it would have been better to stay private or not? Well, when my lawyers like call me 80 times before this call to tell me uh, that I can't, I can't talk about uh, the, the, the relationship between the, the quality of the air and our share price, I can't talk about how much I love my parents. I, I dare not mention that I wrote a PhD. I, I must not laugh at certain jokes and I must avoid anything that would sound optimistic about our business, let alone, God help me, if I say any of my personal views, uh, that I don't like. 
Of course, I'm resisting it. And as you may notice, it's so far they haven't, uh, you know, sh uh, shackled me to their, 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 their massive uh, prison of, 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 of inability to speak on anything that would matter for Palantir. Um, the, the, obviously, you know, it's like we're used to being in the resistance in some ways at Palantir. We, we fought large bureaucracies for the good of this country, I believe, and to some extent won. And we are, to some extent, battling away with short-termism on Wall Street, which I think is one of the most destructive, corrosive attributes of an, of an otherwise uh, interesting and largely functioning system. We told the Wall Streeters to, that we will, we, will, we, we, will, we, will be we will focus on building the long-term health of our company, that we are going to invest uh, in, our, in, our, in our product development and in our clients, uh, uh, it, first and foremost. Uh, and then, you know, you just have to battle it out with them. But, you know, I would say from the perspective of Palantir, we've been at this a long time. I have a lot of people at Palantir who stayed at Palantir uh, because they believed in our company and to some because they believed for reasons that sometimes are hard just to understand. And I struggle to understand and they believed in me. And they, unlike many people in tech, their share price was both going in the wrong direction and a liquid. And they stayed for years and years and years and years. And now those people uh, have shares that are actually quite valuable. And I'm very proud of that. And, you know, I think despite the fact that we have to battle it out, you know, we've been battling it out with Silicon Valley and venture for people. Now we have to battle out the short termism of, of, uh, of, of some, some people, not all people on Wall Street. Uh, and, you know, that's, that may be the price, but I'll tell you, um, you know, the fact that these people at Palantir that have been at Palantir for a long time that stayed while all their friends who were, may not be helping the world very much were making big money and their share price was both in the wrong direction and a liquid. I'm very happy for them. And it makes my life better too, because I don't, I feel even freer. I don't have to wake up in their service every day or still wake up in their service, but I don't feel imprisoned by my responsibility to free them from, from a share price that was pretty bad for them. So it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's a mixed bag. Um, in some ways, but I think for most people at Palantir, especially the people who built the company below me, it, it's been a it's been very important for them, and I view that as very important for me too. And if the price is we've got to move our battle from exposing Silicon Valley's weaknesses to exposing the short termism of of of, of some people on Wall Street, then that that's the price. The, on the short termism point, clearly it's been good for you on the share price. Uh... The share price front and, and you've been in the crosshairs in a good way uh on the wall street bets reddit forum have, did you keep an eye on that is there, is there an aspect where you worry gosh it's been too hot in the short term and that means next year people are going to be asking me why the share price is falling did you worry about that well i mean of course you worry about a lot of things when you're somewhat neurotic and introverted i'm not saying it's never occurred to me but i have a lot of other worries that that worry me a lot more and i like the so-called retail investors for lots of reasons first of all unlike many people they're investing their own money with no safety net many of them are engineers so they actually go out and evaluate our product and by the way they they dispel a lot of kind of what i would call slanderous critiques of uh, of, of palantir written by people that don't ever seem to have engaged with our product and so I really like these people. I'm very happy we DPO'd. Uh, you know, as, as some of you know, when you DPO, you give investors a chance to make money and not just big hedge funds on Wall Street. I'm very proud that normal people uh, investing their own money with their own risk, making their own opinion, made a lot of money. And I'm working, and we are working at Palantir for a long-term outcome. I would, I would say to everybody, you, your audience, retail investors, we're in this for the long haul. If you are speculating or you are, you know, or you're thinking about the short term, you there are plenty of other things to invest in. We're building the company we believe in. We're going to do it for the long haul. There'll be ups and downs. My lawyers won't let me say more than that, but it's obvious. And uh, if you want something else, it's a huge world. Buy some other stock. Yeah. You don't have to buy Palantir. No one's forcing you. We're completely liquid. Do something else. You know, there are a lot of other great companies, less great companies, who knows, everyone has their thing. I'll see you in a couple of years um, uh, and uh, we'll see how we've done. We're, we're busy in our, in our, in our working in our shop, basically, mm -hmm. building the products of the future, delivering them in the present. And we're not planning to really change to, to make anyone particularly happy in the short term.
Um, no, very, very uh, clear and, and strong answer that. I um, wanted to ask quickly about COVID. Um, we talked about the risk on, on data privacy uh, earlier, and obviously there's a lot of talk at the moment about things like vaccine passports. When, when you consider the area of personal health data, do the risks uh, outweigh the potential rewards or the other way around? When you, when you consider the advances, the medical advances that might come out of this with the power of your data analytics and, and getting more of that personal health data? Well, you know, the conversation began with the, the, the failure of legitimacy in Western countries. And I, I think in the end, what, what software has to do is simultaneously increase uh, human health and wealth and increase legitimacy. And so the big problem on all these things is people want to understand, sure, I think most, the vast, vast majority of people are in favor of using software to increase health outcomes. This will also in the pandemic, and this will not be the last pandemic, and this will not be the last time we have to develop and distribute a vaccine. Those are very much uh, uh, things that require software, but people want to know how is it built, how is it distributed, what 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 is it, what is the actual thing we're reacting to? What is the cost? Does it? What is the science? What does the data show? And they want to be able to look into the product and see if, in fact, the things we're doing reflect our general views. And the general views are also very different. What how Germans, French, Japanese people, and Americans view data, or British people, to, as a great example, the, the 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 British view of data privacy and the American view of data privacy are 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 are, are very 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 different. Both are vibrant democracies. So these things also have a certain cultural specific, specific nature that cannot be uh, ignored. And, and, and is that, to use a fancy uh, ex-academic term, is that dialectic between output, transparency, and legitimacy? And we've, we really have not done enough on the, on the interplay between output and legitimacy. And then you get these huge problems. But by the way, we're going to ha obviously have to solve these problems because this will not be the last pandemic. This will be not the last time we have to distribute a vaccine. It will not be the last time we have all these discussions about who goes where under what conditions. And it, it we're and we're not out of it yet. Wanted to end, Alex. Two two more questions, both uh, audience questions that have been sent through whilst we've been going. The first is, what is the single best and the single worst decision you've made as a CEO over the last decade? Well, the single best decision I made was hiring, personally being involved in the hiring of the first 350 people uh, and that, and then building a culture with them. And it's those people in that culture that has powered our everything good about Palantir. Um, that I've made so many bad decisions. <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't even know where to start there, but I mean, I, I honestly think my life was like, besides starting Palantir and probably getting a PhD in Germany, I've made, it was like kind of a lot of bad decisions. But, um, uh, and then, you know, in the context of Palantir, you know, we make bad decisions all the time. We correct. We, our first commercial product was an unmitigated disaster. We didn't correct it quickly enough. We've, you know, sometimes made hiring mistakes. You make a lot of mistakes in business, but in any case, I, I know the best decision I ever made was hiring the first 350 people personally, instilling, helping to instill the culture that became Palantir and being a shepherd of that culture. The, the, the final question kind of brings us back, um, to, to probably the key topic uh, of the first half of the discussion on, on national security threats. Do you think national security threats against America are currently underestimated? And, and what is the biggest one? Well, I mean, you already touched on this. I, I think just the, the, the necessity of America to be in, in the lead in software enhanced systems and in what is broadly called AI is something people understand, but they don't understand it enough. And that will, in the end, if it's one side is a nuclear power and the other side is a dull knife power uh, or a machine gun power, the side that, again, just to repeat what I said before, that, 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 that has the essential equivalent of software and nuclear arms will define the world order. And I don't think we in America or in the West will be particularly happy if that's not us. Well, right on time. In fact, we're a minute early at 10, 1054, Alex. It's really been the a pleasure to have a full a full hour just shy of an hour with you today and, and to go through all of this, the topics that we've just had and uh, our thanks also to, to Margaret and Richard for, for inviting us but uh, Alex I'm sure everyone else remotely will uh, will want to put their hands together to, to thank you for this uh, this great discussion thank you very much no thank you thank you for the questions and thank you to your audience